if you have your cameras on. Okay, I'm going to begin. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Glenda Cruz. I serve on the Council of Temple Israel Greenpoint. And we decided to start this culture club as a way to create a space for discussion within our community because we realized we have so many talented people in our community who are highly creative whether they write novels or make music or do art or as in the case tonight make films or documentary films and we thought it would be a, a fantastic space to create a space where people could come together and a, create, a creative person or group of people could share their art and how they come to produce their art and what are the kinds of influences and what are the kinds of ways they hope that that art is going to have impact on our humanity and on our society. So tonight we are really very, very happy to shift to a focus on documentary film. And we're particularly happy to have Eric Miller and Laureen Platsky with us. Um, I think they are, you, as you will see by the end of tonight, they are a very dynamic duo. Um, and they bring great complementary expertise and skills to their joint project. Eric is a very experienced photojournalist with long experience back into decades and he focuses his work on social justice issues. But from the work of his that I've seen, I think his real strength is the way he tells people's stories. And Laureen is a land rights activist back in her history, and she has worked widely in different uh, ways across national and provincial government. And she's now sharing that expertise by teaching in universities. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, what they're bringing to this project is giving voice in their distinctive ways. But I'm not going to talk too much more. I'm going to hand over to Eric and Laureen. Um, they're going to introduce themselves and we're going to start off with a short trailer of the movie. Um, they will explain to you it has not been released yet, but we're very lucky we're going to get sneak previews of selected clips from the movie um, and then we'll be able to discuss the kind of issues that each of those clips are highlighting. So um, you're all very welcome and please do try and keep your mic muted unless you are speaking in the question and discussion time. Um, I'm going to hand over to you Eric and Laureen and I'm going to mute myself. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Glenda. Um, can we start with the clip first, and then we'll talk from there? The trailer. The trailer, the trailer yeah. Okay. You okay with it, Eric? Sorry, I'm just working on it. Yeah, I'm just having some technical. I'll be with you in a sec. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you come? Can can you come help me? Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, we can share it from my laptop as well. No, it's fine. I've got it now. I think. Um, play again. Yes. Can you hear the sound? No, oh, it was yeah. up here. No. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Eric? Are you I Eric? cannot hear the sound. <coughs> Eric, can we do it from uh, from this side? Sorry, can you not hear? No, no because no. Oh, we tried it earlier and it worked. Um, let me see if I can get onto the site. Really sorry, everybody. This did work when we tried it this afternoon. I'm getting there now. Give me one more minute. We don't have them. Should we try and let Eric try? Linda, um, Adi Fulb is saying that the meeting host hasn't let her in yet. I've let her in three times. Oh dear. <laughs> I've let her in three times and it just says she's joining. Ah. So she'll have to just keep trying also. You know this technology is absolutely wonderful but it sure ain't perfect. And when you do your tests and it works and then you come on the night and it doesn't work. Who knows what happened to the undersea cable for, for, for sending videos and, and data. Hey. The signal may be frozen. I was on an earlier one at 6 o'clock to USA and it froze me out for a minute and I had to rejoin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Autism is a ontstaan gehad as a spoor in the dorp during the 60s and 70s. It was quite a busy, small town. We were poor, but we had so much to give to each other. We were always sharing. Is it now? It's a dorp, I'll eat It's a town, I'll eat it. Because we are trots, we are the play. That makes me hard by you. That we are the the
Okay. Um, it was skipping and it, it didn't play very well. Uh, I think it's probably um, a line problem or something. Um, but okay, that's a brief uh, introduction to the form Hutchinson in the Northern Cape. It's about uh, 10 kilometers from Victoria West. So Glenda gave a, a brief in introduction. I am and have been my entire uh, career a stills photographer and photojournalist. So this was the first time that Laureen, that I and Laureen uh, went into film and, and created a film. I had been experimenting, playing around with video for a while, but this was a huge undertaking that we embarked on quite naively. Um, and we'll go into some of the detail of that. Over the years, I've worked um, across Africa and across South Africa, mostly around news stories. And uh, in the last decade and a half or so, more around social justice issues. And ended up um, getting involved in, film, in filming things during a project that I did around 2010. So 10 years ago, I worked with a group of grandmothers and started filming some of the interviews we did with the grandmothers in Kailicha. And I realized how powerful that was as a mechanism to get some of the messages and some of the emotion and everything across. So it culminated in this uh, film now that we started in 2018. But after Laureen spoken, uh, we're going to a bit more detail about the film. Hi everyone, it's really good to see you all. And uh, thank you for zooming in with us. And thanks Glenda and Eric for organizing this. Um, I'm not known to any of you as a filmmaker. So this was a very first um, foray into, into this particular sector. I've been involved with um, research and activism for many, many years, and first in land issues and then in um, planning issues. I'm, I'm an urban and regional planner, um, but not, not ever practicing as such. I worked in government, as, as Glenda said, national and provincial government for many years. And eventually, when I was about to retire, um, we, we came upon this, this place Hutchinson and Eric will tell you the story of that. So I was there really, you know, carrying the tripod and, um, you know, looking out for, for, for the kids who were going to run into the movie and when the drone was on to try and keep them away at a safe, safe distance, that kind of thing. So this is really something very new and it's something that, well, Eric and I had never worked on a project like this together, other than bringing up our son, of course. But uh, so this is this is all very new and um, it's been an absolute learning curve, but really great fun as well. So why don't you bring about bringing up our son was easy compared to this. <laughs> um, OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we got to start the thing. And it started actually with our son, who's now 28. Um, uh, he's 29. 29. And <laughs> the time, time flies so fast. We, he was, he was, he's been studying overseas for a while and he came back on a visit in 2018, uh, late, 20, sorry, 16. 2016, in August 2016. And we decided that um, we would take him on a road trip so we could have a captive audience and have time to spend talking with him and being with him over a period of days when he wasn't uh, distracted by friends and visiting friends and things. So we got into our car and we started driving up to Johannesburg. And we ended up overnight in Beaufort West. And in the morning, he'd been Googling something or other. And he said, oh, can we go and have a look for this little town? And he said, well, why? We're on our way to Joburg. Um, so long story short, uh, he indicated that it looked interesting and he'd seen about it on Google and it was only a couple of hundred people who lived there. And so we did a detour that took us about nearly three hours in total on the way to Joburg and ended up in Hutchinson on a, on a morning not 
unlike the evening we're having in Cape Town tonight with heavy mist uh, and, a, and a slight um, uh, sprinkle of rain coming through. And it was an extraordinary place to arrive at. And you've seen a small glimpse of what it looks like in, in that clip. And we talked about it. It looked, half of it looked deserted, half of it looked utterly um, desolate and broken down. And when we got back in the car after about a half an hour there and we carried on to, to Johannesburg, we discussed what did we think happened, why, what was the story about there. And we, f we didn't really know a whole lot about the, um, the railways and, and what had happened, the, the grand arc of the story of the railways. Uh, and assumed that it was probably a, a post-1994 story. Anyway, fast forward uh, to a year later and Laureen was on the brink of retirement and had to go to Beaufort West to uh, have a meeting in terms of her work it there. Was during the drought, it was, yeah. uh, you know, trying to work with them in terms of the, the drought that was really getting very serious at the end of 2017. So we decided to do it together and I would go and do some work around the drought and photography work around the drought. And I had been mulling and we'd been talking about Hutchinson for the year uh, before that, since, since we'd been there the first time. So I reached out to various people and tried to find somebody who knew Hutchinson, knew about Hutchinson, had possibly grown up there. And we I phoned several people and reached out to some Facebook groups and whatever. And I got a phone call about four or five days before we left. And the woman on the other end of the phone says, hi, is this Eric Miller? Yes, hi, my name's Marlene. And you saw Marlene uh, in, in the yeah. clip there, but she'll come up again in some other clips. My name's Marlene, and I believe you're looking for people who grew up in Hutchinson and had some stories to tell. Boy, have I got stories to tell you. So as a photojournalist, that was like an absolute music in my head. My God, here's somebody with stories to tell. So we arranged to meet her a few days later. Uh, we met at the Wimpy in, in uh, Beaufort West, which subsequently became our little office away from home. And we often met with her there to fill her in and then to go on to the next part of what we were doing. And she did tell us stories and they were amazing stories and some of them came up in the, in the film and are rendered in the film. Um, let's just, um, can I try and share it from this side? Eric? Uh, should we just try this? Are you wanting clip one now? Should, I, should we just try one, and see if this one works? And then after that, if there's a problem, you can take over from there. I'll make you co-host. Let's just try this one and then see. Okay. I always wanted to return back home. This is home for me, Hutchinson. Come back here. Hearing the birds singing, the beautiful clouds, the tranquility, the calmness, it's, it's just home to me. Although I was born in Beaufort West and I was bred and butted in Beaufort West, most of my childhood memories in Hutchinson, I was just coming here to be um, rejuvenized in terms of the spirit, the legacy. For me as a child, Christmas was the best time because there was a culture of this Ubuntu of about caring, about giving. I know my mother and my grandmother, they would make all these herzogis and ginger bread. Uh, you would find the borkis, the plates just moving from one house to another house. People are exchanging their food and we would share together. We'd literally come together as neighbors and we would share our food. We would dine together. And this is what I miss about our Hutchinson times. Uh, we were poor. We didn't have that much, but we had so much to give to each other. We were always sharing. Hutchinson during...
So as you will notice, that was in pre-COVID-19 days. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what happened was that uh, Marlene offered to take us to Hutchinson. We, we, we'd sat in the wimpy for quite a while talking about, you know, how, how she had experienced it. She went to school in, in Beaufort West, but her mother had lived in Hutchinson. So school holidays, she went back to, to Hutchinson. So it was the next, the next time we thought, well, let's, let's try and make a, a trip up there. And uh, it was Human Rights Day weekend in March. And we took, we took the, the, long, the long weekend and we phoned uh, Marlene and said, can you join us? Would you, would you come to Hutchinson with us and show us around a bit? And that was basically how we got to meet our first group of people. She hadn't seen many of the people that she, she greeted for many years. And uh, when, when they realized who she was and whose daughter she was and so on, the connection was made, made quite quickly. So after that, it became a bit of a, uh, a ritual that every long weekend, because by then I was working at UWC and, um, you know, couldn't just take time off. And so we used to take the long weekends and, and drive up to Hutchinson and spend time there. Um, but maybe you'd like to talk about the next. Well, yeah, before we move on, one of the story, or a couple of the stories that Marlene told us at that first meeting at the Wimpy, and we said to her that we want to meet some of the people and talk about those stories. So she told us stories about how when they were little, there was this old worm who used to come and show movies outside. And there was a sheet tied between trees or whatever. And he would bring an old 16 mil projector and they projected and everybody knew it was like movie night and they would all go running out there and they'd sit under the stars and watch uh, the films. Um, and then she also told us uh, about the swimming pool. There was a swimming pool. There was a very nice recreational area for the white community in, in Hutchinson. Swimming pool, tennis courts. They used to play cricket there. They had an, a lovely recreation hall. So we're going to show another short clip now, which relates to the stories that came out of that we tracked down the man uh, after a long search, we tracked down the worm. And he was described to us as an old worm who used to come in his bucky and show the films. We met him and he is indeed an old worm, but we met him uh, 40, <coughs> 35 years. So he was 26 when he showed the films, but in their minds, he was fixed as an old worm which he is now, and we'll, can we show that clip? Number two, yeah. Ons het op een vrijdag aan die film gedraai in die goedroomloods vir die kledinggemeenskap. En op zaterdag aan het is die selde films gewees in die ontspanningssaal vir die blanke gemeenskap. Vrijdag aan was die hele kledinggemeenskap daar. En uh, soos ek sê, die kinders het plat op die grond gesit, maar hulle het nie, hulle het nie daarvoor omgegeen nie. Hulle uh, was net Die oogjes het geblink en het allemaal net daar vast genaal gesit. En as daar veilig skiet film is, of koude film is, dan het hulle later so ingeleefd dat die betekent met die film stop. Hy was maar nou haar op die wit doek. <laughs> ons het maar sê die tyd TV sy raad, die ons het maar net weile sy raad. <laughs> Kaboy flieks gewees, en het was hartseer flieks gewees. Het was van die apartheid lewe gewees. En het was skop en skiet. <laughs> Hoe kan dat in my oog toegedruk as het daar gekom het? Met skop en skiet. <laughs> maar die lelike goed dat ek my oog toegedruk en vraag om my. Tjomie, sy sal verby. Sal verby. Sal sê die haar. Ja, kijk ek. <laughs> Dit was maar een baie moeilike tyd om saam gespeel. Maar uh, as jy gespeel het, was die een klomp. Die wit is het eerst nog gespeel met blankes. En daarna die hier die keerlinge gaan speel. En die selle dan. When we were very young, this was a swimming pool that we used to watch from the other side of the fence. So one day me and my friends, we dared to cross uh, the railway and we came nearer to the swimming pool. There was this white man and then he just said, we as black kids are not allowed to swim here at the pool. So he literally chased us away and then he just said, no, you guys are not welcome. And so we left. Party that long time 
and I yell at the to Kongini Navi, I swim but for me. So we found ourselves in Hutchinson um, meeting people through Marlene, the, the lady who talked about the action and the, the uh, cowboy flicks and whatever was the first woman we met. And at that stage, we were not even sure where we were going with this and how it was going to turn out. And so suddenly we're confronted with this woman who's completely animated and telling these amazing stories in her very, very animated style. And I'm scrambling and I'm scrambling with the equipment to try and get everything set up because she's gone. Marlene walked in, told her that she must tell us about the films and about this and that. And she's talking and I'm trying to get all my equipment together and I'm trying to slow her down. And in that you were, you were planning to take stills at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was, a, it was a bit of a circus. Um, but she was amazing. And at that time, I also, I really had no idea how to make a film. I didn't know what the process was. I had equipment that I could film people and record the sound, but that doesn't a film make. So it was really quite a struggle to sort of come to terms technically. And that was one of my biggest challenges was to come to terms technically You'll see there were some scenes where I, where uh, it's a drone flying over the area and filming from a drone. I'd never flown a drone before. I got the drone to do this because I knew the big landscapes in the Karoo and the nature of the town just lent itself to that kind of a, a bird's eye view. So I'm trying to juggle between the drone, trying, Laureen trying to keep the children away from the drone. I'm trying to get the footage that I want and that I'm seeing there and the interviews start unfolding. Um, it was just the two of us. We had no crew. It was not a crew. We were the crew. It was Laureen and I, and uh, mostly Marlene, uh, introducing us and helping us. I started, um, we, we had to kind of reinvent the wheel in a sense. Uh, we, we did the first couple of interviews and Laureen started taking over in the interviews because I was struggling with the technical side of the filming and I couldn't follow a lot of the Afrikaans. Her Afrikaans is much better than mine. So she was probing and asking follow-up questions. I was trying to make sure that I was getting it recorded, both visually and, and the audio, and that the framing was right and the exposure and all the little technical things that I was, was coming to terms with. So we kind of worked at that level um, and every now and then things didn't quite go the way they were meant to. Uh, the drone terrified me. I crashed at once. Um, it didn't, it fortunately didn't get too damaged, but it caused an enormous stir in the town and all the children. It was like the biggest thing that ever happened uh, for the children's entertainment for I don't know how long. Um, moving on, let's just show the next clip. So we moved just before that. We moved from the stories that Marlene had initially told us and probing various people about those stories. Um, and it came out when we talked to Martin Oberholzer, the, the former postmaster, that his rendition was different to what other people remembered. He said that they showed it in the recreation in the, um, the movies. At, they showed their movies in the warehouse on the station platform. Yeah. Uh, other people remembered it being outside with a white cloth. They even showed us where the white cloth was hung. So we never quite worked out the mystery of how people remembered it so adamantly, but, but differently. But we also then started uncovering other stories and other memories that people were sharing with us. And then they got a little bit more serious. So the next clip uh, moves into the realm that Laureen felt extremely comfortable and that I had a lot of experience 30 years ago with forced removals. Gedierende aparte thee moes ons bewys gehad het, laat ons een foto gevat het, of ons moet die boekje gedraad. En as ons nou nie die boekje of die bewys het nie, 
dan sluit hulle jou toe. Negen uur mag jy nie meer op straat gewees het. Dan moet jy in die huis is. As hulle vir jou negen uur buiten vang, dan gaat dat sluit hulle jou op. Daai tyd moet die aparte jare was het nie so erg vir, vir ons leerlinge nie, maar het was baie erg vir die swart, as hulle mag jy sonder hy dom pas geloop het nie. Ek dink het was in die jare 60, toe het het so gekom, dat die swart mense moes oorgeplaas gewees het, dit was hartseertorie gewees. Daar was vrouwens gewees, wat swart manne gewees het, gehad het. Daar was <coughs> kinders gewees, wat uit die hewelik gebore was. Ek kon die trane in die mense sy oog sien het, hulle is per spoor wegtrokke, is hulle mebels geverpoer, en die vrouwens het na hulle verwaardloos geraak, hulle het uh, ook soos vluchtelinge geraak, op daar die opaatsien sin, moes ons maar vir hulle herberg in die harte gee, dat hulle kan bly, maar volgens wet kan ons hulle ook nie gehuisvest het, en dit was haar teer toe. I was about six, seven years old. Then a big truck came, and then the people was forced to move. And there was um, a lot of African people that would stay with us, that which were, we used to them because we grow up in front of that people, actually. I'm sorry. So, some of you might be thinking, what is this Hutchinson place? Um, well, it was bigger than a railway siding, but it, it was in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. It was a very major uh, uh, junction. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a line off to um, the northwest through to Carnarvon that went through Victoria West. And many people used to, of course, in those days, travel by train. The roads were not that good. The, the national highways were, were not particularly good. And the taxi system had not uh, really started off in its own right. That was late in the 80s. So the people who were migrant workers who were coming from <coughs> the trans sky and cis sky to work in Cape Town on, you know, with the, the right passes, as, as the old lady said, they were largely traveling by train as well. Um, so, and, and in the movie we show, we, we do an interview with a, one of the train drivers and he talks about the numbers. I mean, there were literally dozens of trains every week um, stopping in Hutchinson. So it, it was a thriving area and there were a number of people who were employed there, but gradually as technology changed off from steam and coal through to electricity and the, um, and then uh, uh, firstly diesel and then electricity, each time jobs were lost and each time there were fewer and fewer people employed by the railways until eventually in the 80s, um, Spoornet started to close down many of the sidings. And it was only if you actually booked a ticket to travel on, on the train from Hutchinson to somewhere else or stop off in Hutchinson that the train would actually stop. It, it doesn't stop otherwise. So all these people lost their jobs. But what happened was that the whites were taken care of. They were moved to Victoria West. They were redeployed, I guess you could say, to Beaufort West, all over the country, some of them. And so it was very difficult for us initially, not having the contacts with the white community or the former white community, um, until I was chatting to a school friend of mine whose brother is a farmer in De Duins, and she said, oh, I knew someone who used to teach in the school at Hutchinson. And suddenly the world opened to us because there was some connection with somebody who was also really keen to tell her story. And she put us in touch with lots of other people. So perhaps we should, we should have a look at that one now. Uh, Uh, Jackson, number four. number four. Number four, yeah. The children that went to the school there all came from Hutchison. The fathers were like the engine drivers, uh, conductors, lime masters, 
and it was very big families. I remember one Monday morning, this girl, little daughter came to the school and here at the back of her head, there was like a gap at size. No hair there, no hair. It was bleeding and it was enough. And I said, you know, what happened to you? She said, no. My father had a party on Saturday night and he and my mother had a fight and I was between them and then he took me by the hair. Taste Dan ga je moest al die goed houden, gooi je om die rissen. Gooi je weer zeker op die. Gooi een beetje lauw water. Een beetje lauw water. Dat is een weerdraad. Dan noem je hem Wanya. Je kan je nou zeggen. Na water. Na water. Na Afrikaan. Die dan die oude was my baie gemakkelijker geweest. Met onze groot mensen. Hier wat voor ons mooie dinge gebaseerd en gebeisend. Om wat ons ouds hulle weg. Kijk hoe ze kan ons zien. Ik zat net een vrouw hier in de iets en wat een patiënt hier heeft. Aan het werk en dan wacht ik ook maar voor haar salaris tot ik kom en het jaak op maar mijn leven. Donker lucht daar als ik kracht heb en als ik salaris en goed wat hier gekomen. So Eric, I think we should um, go on to the, the next one. Um, I just want to make the connection quickly because I'm now for my sins on the liquor board and uh, you will see that uh, uh, abuse of alcohol was very alive and well very much alive and well in the <clears throat> in the former in the white community as it is in the current community most of the people in Hutchinson live off Sasa grants there there are there are only about five jobs and those are all school teachers and the school teachers live in Victoria West so I'd like to yeah Let's go on to the next one. I was 13 years old when I began to work at Andrew Conroy Business for 60 years. 60 years I was in Conroy. I now for We've grown up together, we've grown old together. And you're still with us. And then the next one. <coughs> Number six. Eric, could you? In fact, I think probably just Number go do six and seven next. Eric. Uh, he's doing it. Eric. And the man, I am Mira Johnson. As a lawyer, he's poor. Nee, die Ubuntu moest op alle tijd nie. Dat is een dat mense wat op alle eie gelaat is. Ek is principaal hier by die school van 1991. So hier was so oor die 300 kinders gewees toe ek hier gekom het. Maar soos wat die mense afgeleef was, het die school al minder kinders gehuisvest. Op die oomblik is ons vijf onderwijzers met my ingesluit en is nou so honderd en vijf kinders. Destijds was nie eindig onder probleme by die school. Die kinders was gehoorzaam gewees by destijds nie. Ek moet met hulle praat, met hulle gehoor gegeen. Daar was nie hier en daar probleem wat Opgeteken, 
Okay, we'll, we'll show the last clip right at the end. I just want to kind of um, wrap up a couple of little things here so that people have a chance to ask questions if they want to. Um, there, there were lots of little, really beautiful um, engagements and experiences that we were allowed into uh, after we'd been going into the community, I think in total about... Five long weekends. Yeah. Um, I, there were a couple of long weekends where I went up on my own uh, for about eight or ten days and then Laureen joined <laughs> me at some point and we came back together or so, something like that. Um, and people kind of got used to seeing us and they opened up a little bit more and they were much more comfortable with us. The clip with uh, the man we refer to often as Drunk Jackson, he is the son of Worm Jackson who appeared earlier, um, who works with uh, um, Andrew Conroy and has worked with Andrew for Andrew Conroy for 60 years. Um, and there's a very real tenderness in, in that relationship from Andrew's side, um, but it wasn't clear for me how um, Worm Jackson experienced that in retrospect, but it was a very interesting uh, relationship. And Andrew Conroy was one of those people that every single person we ever talked to about him, every single person who ever told a story about him, talked about him in a positive and respectful way, that he was an extraordinary man, is an extraordinary man. Um, mm -hmm and nobody ever had anything bad to say about him. So it was incredibly interesting to see those little personal things um, unraveling. Just two quick things I want to say, and uh, somebody mentioned about the music, I think in the comments or, or somewhere I saw a comment about the music. We, quite early on in the process, I was clear in my head about the kind of pace that I wanted the film to be. It had to kind of match the kind of Karoo tempo and that it was almost like a cowboy movie with a tumbleweed rolling across the plains in the wind and just a very slow and almost delicate pace. And the drone kind of captured some of that. And I wanted music that captured some of that. There was a long story about how I first met the music of Gert Klocknell that you hear coming through in, in some of the scenes. And for ages, I sort of hesitated, should I get him? Will he let me use the music? Can I afford it? Uh, you know, and lots of things that's kind of held me back. And eventually I had to get hold of him. Long story short, we met Gert Klocknell at his house in Beaufort West. He's extremely well known in particular circles in that community and certain communities. Um, and we met him and we sat and drank wine with him in the garden of his friend's house. And we all got a, just a teeny, teeny, teeny little bit um, inebriated. And after a very lovely conversation and I explained to him what we wanted and he'd been and looked at my Facebook page so he knew some of the stuff that I was doing. Um, and at the end of it, I said, so, you know, what we're really asking is if you'll let us use the film. And he said, yeah, of the course. Music. I mean, I use the, the music in the film. <laughs> he said, yeah, of course. And I said, well, can we talk about um, payment for it? So he says, no, don't worry about it. So I have a particular, and I don't want anyone to take this little story up the wrong way, but I have a particular group of friends and we're very close and warm with each other. And every now and then somebody does something really right <clears throat> and somebody in the group will say, oh, John, or oh, Mike, or whatever, I want to marry you and have your children as a kind of a way of expressing our appreciation for somebody, something that somebody did. And I blurted out to Gert Flocknell, oh, Gert, I want to marry you. But I held back on the children because I didn't feel I knew him well enough at that point. But he was amazing. And we'd met with him several times, and he's been unbelievably um, positive about the film. We put the film together in a rough cut and we worked with a, an editor, um, Anna Marie James, who is extraordinary and she just understood what we were trying to do and she put it together in such a beautiful way. So we took a rough cut back to the community and we showed everybody except I think two people that we couldn't get hold of. And people were amazing in their reactions to it. Um, 
even those cl that clip, and there's another clip of Drake Jackson acting out. And when I spoke to him and the headmaster that you saw there also spoke to him afterwards and said, are you okay? How do you feel about it? He said, no, that's who I am. Everybody knows that's who I am. You know, he was absolutely resigned to it. Um, but we got really, really good and encouraging feedback from everybody in the community that saw the film and who was in the film. Um, should we? So I think we should, yeah. Throw it open to questions. Or do you want to have the last clip and then throw it open to questions? No, we'll show the last clip okay. just to say goodbye to people. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, yes a hand, Raymond Scholny. Uh, so that was very special and a wonderful project. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. <laughs> just a, a specific question, if I may. I mean, um, it's heart-rending the forced removals piece and families being torn apart. You know, in other parts of the country, uh, when the African black people were kind of forcibly removed, uh, they were taken to places that uh, were far, far worse. And they often, you know, just didn't have food or any means to make life. Do you have any idea as to what happened to the black people, where they were removed to, etc.? Did you follow that at all? Well, we couldn't really follow it because, um, unfortunately, there was nobody left there who knew where they'd been taken. But... It seems mostly to the Siskai, and that was the time that places like Sada and Whittlesey and Dumbaza um, were, were started uh, in, in, in that Bantustan era. So, uh, but Jackson, the old, uh, old man who is actually, his surname is Ngugu, and he um, came there after his mother had been thrown off a farm. And they sort of passed for coloured, as it were. So there are a lot of stories, and, and you'll see quite a lot of the children and are, are quite mixed, and they the, some of them speak closer at home. So there's still some connections, and I think some people have come back from from those uh, Siskai camps back to to Hutchinson because it was a relatively better life, tough as it was. Right, we open for questions. Nolene, go ahead. How do you know I want to ask a question? Because you are no. unmuted. <laughs> it shows. It radiates out the screen. So I want, the one thing I wanted to ask you was, you mentioned something about spur nets. So, so would they not, spoil it? I mean, did the town, who owns the town? Is it the people own their homes or who, who, how did it work? Did the white people own their homes? I mean, how did it work? And what's Spurnet's role in it? Which I assume would be a question for many of these, of me, the story of many of these sort of siding and ta associated towns that would have closed down. So the, so the houses were all built, so, so the coloured houses are built on one side of the track and the white houses were built on the other side of the track. Now everybody, um, there are no more white people in the town and they all live in uh, both sides of the track. But there's one big earth which is this, owned by Spornet and that includes um, the recreation hall, all the houses um, and, and the coloured side. The only bits of land that were not owned by Spornet was uh, the school. The school was is owned by the education department. And then there was a farmhouse one side with a shop and an abattoir. And there had been a hotel, but that burnt down many years ago. And then, and then across the line on the other side is um, Andrew Conroy's farm which is the farm that has, um, a, a, it, 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 has all, it, it provides the water, the, the entire water source for Victoria West. And it used to provide the water for the steam and the coal was stored there and all that kind of thing. So there is a, a separate farm, but the Spornet houses, I mean, and this is the big issue. If you see the movie, you'll see how people talk about wanting those houses because they've lived in them for so many years. And Spornet have yet to hand over the houses to the municipality and get them subdivided. The plots, you know, the, the urban sub, 
the one big earth subdivided, and then they could be, you know, handed out to people. At the moment, they get in, in the in the formal houses, they get electricity and water, you know, uh, uh, up up to a certain amount, they get it free from the municipality. We did, sorry, we did try and get hold of um, Spoonet and could not get them. We tried to tie down the ANC mayor in the municipality and he said that he was not getting any joy. But that's a longer story and you'll see more of it in the film. We haven't given up. <laughs> Thank you. Nick, the next I have a, <clears throat> a remark rather than a question. Okay. Okay, Glenn. Go for it. Well, well I'm fortunate to, to have uh, have seen the whole movie, uh, and it really, if you get a chance, please watch it. It's actually quite extraordinary from from mainly two points of view. the The visual is I can still remember some of the scenes. I saw this movie months ago, and because of the strength of some of those visuals from uh, Eric's eye and his eye as a photographer. It's, it's always great when a photographer becomes a cinematographer because they bring that, that visual sensibility. Mm -hmm. And it shows in this movie, it comes through and I, I can sit here and, and recall some shots. That's how beautiful it is. And secondly, from the sociological and political, it's a microcosm of South African life over a certain period. And the way Eric and Laureen have, have shown it, it's the, the point isn't hammered home, the point comes to you. It, it's done in, in such a way that you come out of the understanding on a, on a visceral level what transpired. And the story of Hutchinson obviously is not unique to Hutch, Hutchinson. And from that point of view, it's also well, well worth watching. So thanks, Eric and Laureen. Thank you, Basil, for that. Thanks, Basil. Um, Iris Burkett, I'm not well, sure. We had uh, Harris Gordon first. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Harris Gordon. Where's Harris Gordon? Oh, there's Harris Gordon. Harris Gordon, go ahead. You muted, Harris? Oh. He's not muted. No, he's muted. No. no. Unmute again? Oh, dear. Harris, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Can you write your question on the chat and I'll read it out? Thanks. In mm. the meantime, Mr. Burkett, you can go. Yeah, it's Howard. You can hear me, yes? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> we have, we've spent a lot of time in Darling, as we said, and we're trying to get a sense of what we're seeing here in this town, was it true in the darlings of the country? Was it true all over the country? The dorps, Were, yeah. the dorps and dorpies all over the country, or is this just one special story? No, it's very much uh, typical. So, so it's not such so much that it's an apartheid story. It, although, of course, what happened there was was a result of technology changes from steam to diesel to electricity. Um, and at each time, because of the technology changes, fewer people were needed and the railways started to, I mean, they, they the, 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 the technology also allowed um, the trains to travel without stopping further and further. Then of course the technology changes were also as I said, um, in, in the way passengers were traveling. So, so people were now driving to Johannes, between Johannesburg and Cape Town more on, on, on the national roads. Um, taxis had taken over uh, train, trains for, for migrant workers and so on. So those, those things were, were universal. I, I, in fact, they, people who've seen it, a couple of friends of mine in the States said, you know, th th there are parallels with what's happened to some of the smaller towns in the States and, and in different parts of the world. So it's a, it's a story of the railways, but how it was experienced was so different. For people who were not white, 
they were not taken care of. So, you know, one old man, Umvai, told us, well, he still has a pension and he has a pension from the railways and he, he lives in one of the former White Houses now and he's, he's happy enough. But, you know, when, when the whites lost their jobs, in, um, they, they were redeployed, they were given pensions, they were given, there were new houses built for them in Victoria West. Okay, uh, no, Victoria West as and, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, in fact, you know, they were just taken care of very differently. So the impact of those changes was very different on them. But, yes, it, it was, it's not unique to Hutchinson. Thank you. Okay, can I just share a couple of questions that have come up on the chat? Um, Harris Gordon is saying that the wider context is the technology change, which is continuing at a faster pace even today. Um, what are the lessons for society dealing with it now? Mm -hmm. That's the one. And then a very different question from Eileen Weinrong. What intrigued your son about this town to visit? Um, well, <laughs> we're not allowed to tell that story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was a at that stage there was a romantic connection with the name. Let's just leave it at that. He <laughs> has seen the, he has seen the movie and he's he's given us a lot of critique and and we've incorporated it and so on. So he's very happy with it. Uh, what are the lessons? <clears throat> well, I you know I uh, it was interesting because. Somebody in, in Victoria West who saw it, we showed it at the Apollo movie house, the Art Deco movie house. And somebody pointed out that, you know, all this fourth industrial revolution and all that stuff. I think that the main issue here is with education, you can move, you can move physically. You could always come back to a place like Hutchinson Mm. But if you have no education and you, you know, you drink yourself stupid, then there, there really isn't much option. But the people, I mean, there, there's a professor of um, uh, hydrology at the University of Pretoria who was born and bred in Hutchinson. And, you know, so people will tell you the story. It's not impossible, but you do need uh teachers and some of those teachers there that we met were real stars in the, in those really difficult circumstances they were helping motivate the kids they were you know making sure that they were fed and if the parents were out drunk they in fact auntie sophie one of the the, the teachers we arrived one sunday afternoon and she said no 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 you can't stay now i'm busy i've, I've got to go around to all the the houses and tell the parents that they must get their children ready. It's exams tomorrow. And she took it upon herself on Sunday afternoon to walk from house to house to go and, you know, shivvy up the parents to make sure their kids would be ready. So I, I think, you know, I think really that that is what makes you flexible. And that's, you know, how you can find something else to do. If I may add, one thing that really strikes me is this very strong sense of community that came up and not only the tight community of the past when the town was thriving and when people are looking back in their memories, but just the sense of community that was still there in the present despite the bleakness. And I found your, your clip of Marlene in the beginning where she says, this is the most beautiful place. It's where you can be free and you can enjoy the fresh air. And she's sitting in the bleakest setting ever of abandoned buildings, it was incredibly powerful. But they've been vandalized and that's that's a big issue in the, in the community. The community is really not happy with what some people are doing there. When we showed the film the very first time in Hutchinson, we showed it in a classroom with a white sheet hanging up and it was packed with how many people about 140 150 yes. people in a classroom it was a, it was like a steam bath it was not COVID time <laughs> yeah um and they absolutely loved it they raw they did exactly what um martin oberholzer described the children with the, with the cowboy movies they they laughed they shouted they got excited when they saw somebody they knew and given that they all knew each other you know that was all the way through the film so there's a sense of the community in that regard, but it's not a cohesive community.
community in terms of leadership mm -hmm. and setting values right through the community. And that's the struggle of the school, which is the only really well-functioning organization that's, that's active in the community. But they only have 105 children left there or dead then. Any other questions? I see lots of questions coming up on the side and I haven't had a chance to sort of... There's a lot in the comments, so I can share some more unless somebody else wants to, to raise a question. Jeremy's iPad. Hi, it's Fran here. Hi, Laureen. Hi, Eric. Hi. <laughs> Uh, it's great to it's great to hear the story and having I've actually been through Hutchinson a few times on my way to Victoria West in my youth by train oh, wow. and uh, chatting to my parents actually there's an interesting Jewish history from our side that comes through Hutchinson mm -hmm. and um, my parents are on this chat and I know their video doesn't work but I'd really like to ask my mom to just mm -hmm. tell everyone just the, the Jewish connection that comes in from the like the 1920s. Wow. Okay. Okay. Mother so, Lorraine, can you please share okay. with us a bit? I'm sharing. In the 20s, my dad came from Lithuania and couldn't make a living in Johannesburg and got on a train to go to Cape Town to, to find good work. And uh, when he had, they arrived at Hutchinson, there were, was a Jewish man with a a shop on the station and he got off the train and he started talking to the man and the Unterstuhlschule, he took his suitcases off the train and he was there for two years and he said he learned how to play clubias there and his twin brother joined him and he became the Shechut in um, Hutchinson. So that's, wow. that's there. I, I think there's somebody else might be in this group because I know I had an exchange with somebody who told me about their family, uh, a Jewish family who had also been in Hutchinson. Oh, that's fantastic. If there is somebody in the group. Does that person want to share? Okay, but yes, I didn't know and we didn't hear from anybody, nobody mentioned it. Uh, in, in the interviews we did, they talked about uh, various shop owners and people who had uh, a business that was an absolute gold mine selling coffee to the late night train passengers and that sort of thing. Um, but it was from the 60s. I, I don't think we heard, we didn't hear any stories yeah. from before the 60s. Yeah. Um, the Jewish Report did an interview and a little article about the film. And they asked me during the interview, was there any Jewish connection? And at that point, I had no idea. And that only came out. I think somebody who read that report then contacted us to tell us about their family. How do you mute? How do you mute? It? Okay. Um, okay. So there are a couple of comments about. Um, people who have had similar experiences in other town. Amelie, I don't know if you want to share. I spent the first three and a half years of my life in a town called Tenno, Kennard in the Northwestern Cape. And can you imagine that it looks pretty much like that today? Yeah. We'd love to go back. Yeah. I guess uh, Victoria West is, is much more picturesque in that, you know, the, the, there's some beautiful old buildings and things, whereas Hutchinson was pretty much built after the Second World War. And, you know, there's a lot of the, those fairly substantial houses were, you know, well endowed with old Dover stoves and all sorts of things like that on the white side. And on, on the colored side, you know, there were township houses and it's not, not particularly attractive. But uh, yeah, so, so some of the Hutchinson people said to us, why don't you help us to become a little tourist place like Mikey's Fontaine? But I'm afraid nothing is quite as attractive as the buildings in Mikey's Fontaine or even what's yeah. left of them. I see a message from Raymond Skolny about um, uh, if we didn't tell the story of, Hutch of the people of Hutchinson, who would have? I don't know. And that was one of the things that really 
um, engaged me in the beginning when, when we looked around and when, I went, when we went back the second time with Marlene um, and heard the stories. And that's one of the things that, that happens to me as a journalist traveling around is that you come across stories that you, you can recognize have a value and are worth telling. And I have no idea if anyone would ever have stopped in Hutchinson and taken the time to tell the story. It's far. Um, and so I was extremely excited about being able to do that. And Marlene was very excited and continues even now when I phone her and I tell her, so for example, um, Glenda mentioned that we've been accepted into Encounters Film Festival and into the Josie Film Festival. So it will be available for people to watch uh, in, in uh, August. She gets as excited as we do now that her story and her town story is out there and getting recognized and being seen by people. So just in response to that. Uh, are there any other questions? We have one last clip, a minute and a half. Um, when everybody's done with questions. I think we've covered everything off the chat. Is anybody else want to raise something? Or share anything that they have on the small town? Okay, well, I'm sure, um, okay, I'll, we'll watch the clip and then we'll close formally. Okay. <laughs> And I Toe gaan vragen een beetje willen lopen, ik zou over een week een beetje rondgestapt en ik plek vragen voor, voor je leid, ik is gevraagd, wil je een soccer spelen, wil je een, wil je een coach geweest? En hulle, hulle zijn respond was zomaar duidelijk aan mij geweest, ja, dit gaat ons in die problemen in. Ons is, ons zien ons is die konings. So, ons soccer van zijn naam. En ons hadden het maak die Hazens en Kings, united by spirit. Okay, Eric and Noreen, last words. Well, there's lots more. The movie's an hour long, so there's lots more in it. Come and see it. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. This was lovely. It was really lovely to talk to people and to get the questions. And thank you for the very supportive comments and, and uh, questions from people. Thanks, thank you, Eric. Thank you for this powerful experience. Thank you. I can't wait to see it. Where can we see it? Uh, or sleeps. <laughs> encounters. It will be on the encounters. encounters. Okay, encounters. Okay. Encounters have changed their format this year from the Labia and Johannesburg Theatre. It's going to be online, so you can see it from anywhere in South Africa. And and the Josie Film Festival. And at the Josie Film Festival in yeah. September as well, also online. We'll see that it counters online. I yeah. think, I think one of small, I think it's one of the small um, silver linings of this whole COVID thing is that so much of the stuff is now being made available online to bigger audiences um, and making it much more accessible to a lot of people. So that part of it is quite nice. Good. So thank you, Eric and Laureen, for coming and sharing your passion project. I think not many people are lucky enough to have a partnership like yours that you've spent for what four or five years being able to pursue this passion project and making something 
that see that is clearly very meaningful but looks absolutely beautiful and with that evocative music as well so congratulations and well done and we look forward to seeing the movie and thank you for taking the time to prepare and share with us so effectively thank you, Erica, Glenda as well and for the invitation yeah. Thank you. It means a lot. Thank you very much. Good. And thanks to Eric Beswick for the backup tech. We got it right. It doesn't sure. always start exactly how you want it, but we got it right and we're getting it right better. And we'll see you next month. We've got quite an exciting, hopefully an, an exciting author lined up for next month. So watch the space.